Uh, we're going to be talking about the Heart's technical package. It was launched in 2018. Um, it was part of the Global Health Initiative uh, by the World Health Organization, and it's endorsed by uh, 11 partner organizations, including the World Heart Federation, uh, and also Resolve to Save Lives and Others. Um, it's focused on managing hypertension uh, and other cardiovascular risk factors at the primary care level. And it offers practical step-by-step -step modules supported by an overarching technical document. Uh, it's based on the concept of integration, screening for individual risk factors to help prevent cardiovascular disease uh, through detection, uh, treatment and control um, of hypertension and diabetes together. It's been adopted, we'll hear, by more than 40 countries with promising results. So this session, we want to look at the real-world impact of hearts uh, by presenting case studies from implementing countries and to look at the future, what does the future hold, uh, with experts reflecting on how the framework uh, should evolve to remain relevant. So I have with me another expert panel which I'd like to welcome to the stage, uh, Dr. Jagat Narula, as you know, President-elect of the World Heart Federation, leading physician scientist and uh, executive vice president and chief academic officer at the University of Texas Health in Houston. Welcome uh, to you. Uh, also, Dr. Taskin Khan, uh, medical officer for cardiovascular diseases at the World Health Organization, who wrote its hypertension guidelines. Thank you very much and Dr. Vilma Irizola, who is the Director of the Department of Chronic Diseases uh, at the Institute for Clinical Effectiveness and Health Policy in Buenos Aires in Argentina, a cardiologist by background, and also Dr. Fernando uh, Thomas Zanetti, a Professor of Medicine at the Universidad de la Frontera in Chile, uh, who is a surgeon and a specialist in internal medicine and cardiology. So thank you so much. Now, Dr. Khan, I, uh, I attempted to introduce that looking at my notes. I'm sure you can give us a much better idea of giving us an overview of the Heart's technical package. Please. Uh, sure. So, HEARTS is actually um, a sort of uh, anagram for a few <laughs> different modules. Um, but actually, what the, pa what the package does is it presents a public health approach to managing hypertension. And so, when you look at traditional public health programs, they all run in a similar manner. There's nothing different from running an immunization program to a tuberculosis program to an HIV program. The elements are all the same. And so what was lacking in the area of cardiovascular diseases or non-communicable diseases in general was this simplified approach towards a population intervention. Um, and I make that quite distinctly because it is different from treating people at the individual level. And so there's like sort of five core elements that we look at. We're looking at a drug and dose specific protocol. So something really simple, just three steps, two doses of each drug, and something really, really simple that people can follow. We look at access to blood pressure devices because hypertension is real simple. You don't need any labs, you don't need anything else, you just need a validated functional device to take someone's blood pressure. Really easy, can be done at primary care, and yet surprisingly, you don't find that equipment in most countries. Then we need access to medicines because if you don't have medication available, particularly in sufficient quantity, you are going to lose patients and you're going to lose trust in the public health system. We have team-based care. We moved a little away from task shifting or calling it task shifting towards more a team approach. Why? Because you can involve from community health workers going up in the tranche in hypertension care. And I think that's pretty important to understand, and that's something that's really localized and contextualized depending on the country. And the last component is good information systems that collect patient-level outcome data. So in the HEARTS package, what we're stressing is that we, we, I understand more than anybody else, indicators are a huge challenge. And collecting them, particularly in primary care, is difficult. 
And so we said, if you can't collect anything else for hypertension, what should you be collecting? And that's control rates of hypertension. You should collect control rates because they tell you about not only your patient outcome and whether you're preventing stroke and heart attacks, which is the major killer uh, globally, but they also tell you about your program. Because you can envisage that if you've got good hypertension control, you have good access to medication, you have good access to validated devices, you have a team-based approach, your patients are retained in care, and it tells you everything about your program. So it's just one indicator, really. Of course, there are others, but one core indicator, I'd like to say, um, as part of the package. And, and so I've spoken a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, wanted, I just, you, I just wanted to, to butt in and say, uh, it may be obvious to many people in this room, but I just wanted to, to just take one step back and why did the WHO decide to do it in the first place? Well, I don't need to preach to this room. I'm quite sure you know. Cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death. But hypertension is the single most prevalent risk factor worldwide. It is the risk factor that's killing more people than things like unsafe water, unsanitary uh, conditions, uh, you know, unsafe sex. All the things that were traditionally risk factors have actually been outnumbered by uh, high systolic blood pressure. And so one in three adults globally have hypertension. It's a huge public health concern, but also uh, of epidemic proportions, I'd like to say. Um, and so something had to be done for this risk factor mm. that's causing so much of yeah. disease. So tell me about some of the impacts that you've had in, in some successes in those 40 countries that it's been introduced. So yes, Jackie. 40 plus countries now have a single protocol based algorithm for hearts and are actually collecting data on hypertension control. Two of the most important things that we think that defines you as a hearts country. And to date, we have over 20 million patients on treatment. And a lot of people ask 20 million, you know, it's not a big number <laughs> when you look at it, but it is a big number. Because when we started, there were zero people on a standard drug treatment regimen for hypertension. And so to see the progress in five years and to reach you know, over 20 million is a big success. And we've seen it across different regions. Almost every region, uh, there's a country adopting hearts. But we've also seen initiatives from the countries where they want to scale it and take it to nationalization. And India is a very good example of that. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll come back to you, Dr. Khan, in a minute, but let me come to Dr. Irizola. Um, from your perspective, um, what have been some of the challenges in implementing uh, hearts in the Latin America and Caribbean region? Tell, tell me a little bit more about uh, what's been happening there. Thank you. Thank you, Shaggy. And I agree with, with asking that we have a lot of successes really and that's very encouraging um, but we have challenges and I would say that in the Latin American region and the Caribbean we have different challenges in different countries according to two main variables which are first the different uh, organization of the healthcare systems that we have in different countries and second the different stages in the implementation of the HATS initiative in different countries as well. So they, they, there are different challenges according to these two variables. But we also have commonalities. We have common problems and I would uh, like to highlight four of them. The first one is limited resources, both human and financial resources in our country. That's a great limitation. Second, we have um, a challenge in terms of data management, data availability, good quality data. Taskin mentioned that as well. It's, it's one of the pillars of the, of the HATS initiative. Uh, the third one is fragmentation and, and lack of coordination uh, between different levels of care in our countries. And the fourth one is sustainability 
of, of this uh, initiative. So, for example, in terms of limited human resources, um, we need to train and retrain um, uh, health professionals be because of a high turnover in, in many facilities in our countries. For example, in terms of financial uh, challenges, uh, sometimes it's really difficult to provide healthcare facilities with uh, validated devices or uh, the lack of availability of medication mm. sometimes is, is yeah. a challenge. In so the, so in how, the, how have you been able to overcome these challenges? You, you want solutions, Jackie? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think that there are things to, um, that we can do to strengthen our primary care systems because primary care is the basis of the HART initiative. Mm. And I think that one thing that we can work for is capacity building. So capacity building is, is really important in our country. It's a train-the-trainer approach, for example, to overcome this high turnover that we have in, in our centers, um, data systems. I mean, high quality data systems, that's key. In our countries, and sometimes we have differences within the same country, in different districts, there are facilities that are working with electronic health records, but there are other facilities that are still working on paper. So it's very difficult to get those high quality data we need to monitor and evaluate the program. We have to work on that. And also, we used to, uh, I mean, we, we sometimes have different systems, data systems within the same country that are not interoperable among each other. So those are mm. things that we can uh, improve to strength mm. the, the, these difficulties. Okay, thank you very much. But let me come on to Chile now. What's the situation in, in Chile? Can you share, uh, Dr. Zanetti, some kind of some of the effective uh, and successful case studies? Let's move back to success rather than problems, shall we? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, it's important to to have a, a couple of things in mind. Uh, Chile has about 20 million people. 80 percent belong to the public health system, and 20 percent are the private insurance. And we have had a cardiovascular prevention program for, for 50 years, really. Uh, and in each uh, health facility, urban or rural uh, in the country, we had this uh, program implemented. So really, the, the challenge was uh, to adapt our, our program to what are the hard guidelines. So, uh, so the Ministry of Health invited a group of people from scientific societies or uh, universities to work with them. So the, the first challenge was to how we will assess risk because we were using a, a Framingham adapted uh, equation for, for the parameters of Chile. But now we have the application from, from the heart and also, we have uh, some studies done in Chile that have shown that the, the system used in, in the US or the low risk uh, score for the, of the European society work well also in Chile, or which one we should select. Uh, we don't have big cohort to, to run that. So finally, we agree with the Ministry of Health that they will look at the, at the prognosis of the individuals involved in the first and second national health survey and follow them. We have the, the we can do, we can identify them by the national ID and to see which, which of these four alternatives fits better. The, the, the second challenge was the protocol and uh, there is a part of the protocol that it's, uh, it's the most difficult to really is change lifestyle, uh, but we, we tend to adapt what, what Hart says and just make it available for, for primary care through courses or online resources. And then we discuss the, the pharmacological uh, 
uh, possibilities, and we would love to have had a fixed dose combination for the program, or at least have uh, some kind of long acting mm. um, aldosterone antagonist. However, it was far beyond the, the country possibility, so we end up having um, losartan plus amlodipine or diuretics as an alternative, starting with two of them. A couple of things about uh, the validity of the blood pressure measurement. It has two sides. One is to train the people in primary care to take blood pressure properly, and it was done through in-person activities. The Hypertension Society helped us go into different regions making seminars on that, and also through online course. And the second part is to have validated equipment. So the Ministry of Health put in his page the validated equipment that is available in the country, and we have evidence that between the 2018 and 2020, the proportion of uh, equipment, validated equipment, in by was uh, improved from one third to mm. two thirds, so it's, it's moving forward. Thank you for that, Dr. Okay. Zanetti. I, I'm going to come to Dr. Nirul in, in one second, but I also want to ask Dr. Khan, thinking about some of those challenges that uh, in Argentina and Chile, I just wanted to ask about what the WHO actually does. You know, what role do you play in, in facilitating the implementation of HEART in, at the country level? And how, how did you help, how have you helped address some of the challenges that they've talked about? Sure. So WHO is made up of uh, headquarters and six regional offices. And so at headquarters, we, you know, develop norms and policies and standards and things like the Hearts Package. And at regional level and country level, that's where the support for implementation happens. But I have to be clear here, the WHO is the secretariat and its main function and responsibility is to influence policy, even at country level, and to deal with some of these challenges, for example, validated BP devices. The Pan American Health Organization or the region of the Americas came up with a list of validated devices. And what they're trying to do is to get countries to endorse that, as you said, for example, in Chile, so that they only procure validated devices. Um, there's also things like pooling procurement mechanisms for purchases of medication. Um, and there's also a lot of technical support for getting those protocols and encouraging people to, to actually use them. But in terms of boots on the ground, you're going to see WHO people in the facility. Very unlikely. That's not how WHO <laughs> functions. So let me just make that a bit clear. Sure. It's not like the polio program. No. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Khan. Um, Dr. Narula, um, obviously we've heard about primary health care systems being strengthened and all the different challenges that these countries have needed. How can the World Health Federation help strengthen health systems worldwide to better sustain these types of initiatives like the HEARTS program? What role do you have in fostering these global partnerships? Uh, thank you, Jackie. I think the answer is extremely simple, just one liner, that uh, linking WHO with the, with the countries through its uh, societies and foundations, uh, which is our network. So uh, actually, uh, I mean, that is, that is our role. And uh, thunder is theirs because for the scheme to have uh, participated in developing this uh, uh, extraordinary technical package. And uh, then at the uh, level of implementation when it comes to the local stakeholders and leaders for that. So the way I would like to answer that uh, would be that uh, in, in, in three points, simple uh, three points. One, that World Heart Federation is uh, committed to the global mission of cardiovascular health for everyone, everywhere. And uh, with an emphasis on the low and middle income countries where the burden of the cardiovascular diseases, for that matter, the NCDs, is uh, overwhelming. Secondly, that uh, uh, WHF uh, collaboration uh, with uh, our uh, uh, 
societies and uh, with the foundations that exist in uh, more than 100 countries mm. there. So it provides us a platform for helping them strategize uh, that the cardiovascular diseases are at the heart of it and uh, we need to prioritize them. And uh, thirdly, that uh, we work with the, we closely with the global health organizations quite like uh, WHO and uh, other stakeholders so as to ensure the applicability which is uh, conducive to the <coughs> local circumstances through development of our roadmaps. Mm -hmm. And how do you think that the World Health Federation can use its advocacy platform to uh, expand and increase broader adoption um, of the, uh, the technical package, which obviously you say is a, such a positive uh, uh, step forward? Uh, so, uh, most important uh, part here is that uh, there are two uh, important uh, components of this. One is that uh, the, we are the ones who would definitely be supporting or uh, kind of endorsing the applicability of the universal health care. And mm. secondly, that it needs to go into the hands of the primary care providers. Mm. So I think these are the two most important things which we need to mm. uh, disseminate. Uh, I mean, developing the evidence is our role as the cardiologists or mm. as the researchers or as the epidemiologists and all, but then the application has to be uh, in the hands of the primary care physician. So trying to develop this, for example, the use of uh, uh, the media like uh, having uh, a World Heart Summit or the specialty meetings or our World Congress of Cardiology that we do with one constituent member sure. of ours every single year. So those give us mm. an adequate platform to disseminate uh, what uh, is being produced. And then also the guidelines and all which are being produced by the, our uh, strategic partners like ACC, AHA or EFC, our uh, Chinese uh, partners and also locally, mm. how do we really connect them to the uh, end users. Yes. So that would be the way to Great, thank you. I saw you nodding there, Dr. Arizola. You, you presumably support uh, uh, what uh, the World Heart Federation are doing. <laughs> you literally looked like you were, <laughs> you were nodding profusely. I'm going to open it up to uh, the floor, so please do come to the microphones and ask your questions. While you're uh, standing up, I'm going to ask Dr. Khan. You mentioned India before. Um, just want to expand a little bit about what's been successful there, you know, what have been the outcomes? Uh, you know, how soon were the benefits and just give us a flavour before we come to the questions. So, of the 20 million globally, <laughs> India is a large portion of that 20 million. India is um, the biggest, I would say, demonstration of hearts. But we were very, um, we were very humbled because the Ministry of Health decided last year to nationalize, um, you know, in India it was called the India Hypertension Project. And they decided to nationalize it and they've set a very, very ambitious target for 2025 to have 75 million patients on treatment for hypertension uh, and or diabetes using a standard protocol by 2025, the 75 by 25 initiative. And so some of the workers that were initially supported through catalytic funding um, is now taken up by the ministry. Almost every state has a standard protocol endorsed by the state. And they've really done a lot in their supply chain work to ensure that procurement and availability of drugs I I is now there. Mm. Okay. And uh, I just want to come on and talk about evaluation. I mean, obviously, you've got some facts and figures there. But in terms of evaluating how the whole program is going, how are you doing that? So that's the next step, actually, right. Jackie. The, the first step was trying to get people to buy in, to endorse hearts. And it's funny because success actually breeds success. We've shown that the model can work. We've shown that it's a primary care intervention. And now we're looking more at developing like a scorecard of actually showing maps of how countries are implementing and how they're doing. 
um, a little bit of competitiveness, yeah. I think. Okay. Well, I want to bring in um, Dr. Irisola because um, I think that you wanted to talk about implementation science. Now, this is not something that I know much about. Um, the, stu the study of methods and strategies to facilitate the uptake of evidence-based practice. Um, I'm on the right lines, but you know, tell us a little bit more about it. What's the role here, and how can the science, this science field, contribute to the success of Hearts? Thank you, Chagi. I, I think that uh, implementation science can have a really important role in the monitoring and evaluation of the Hearts initiative using scientific methods. And um, in this sense, in implementation science, there are three pillars which are a deep knowledge of the context, meaningful stakeholder engagement and involvement, and co-creation of implementation strategies, which is actually very much aligned with the philosophy and the logic underlying the HEARTS initiative. We have a basket of tools to do that. So I think that it, it would be a great contribution to include implementation science methodologies uh, into the monitoring and evaluation mm. process of the HEARTS uh, initiative. Yesterday, Alvaro mentioned the, the process of co-creation and, and co-adaptation with key stakeholders, and uh, that's HEARTS in a, in a sentence. Mm. Thank you very much for that. That's, uh, that's excellent. But I've, I've, I've got lots more questions for myself, but let's come to the audience. Uh, gentlemen in the front, please. Thank you. I'm Cesar Bernstein from Argentina. Uh, it's uh, capital to know the, the impact of uh, this uh, protocol, uh, know a little the differences, the comparison between the people by protocol and out of it with the general population. So I want to, uh, to, to remember with you uh, this point and the cost effectiveness is the analysis if you have something about this. Thank you. Cost-effective analysis. Yeah, I think that's one for you, Dr. Kahn. <laughs> so I can tell you we did modeling last year when we did the global hypertension report, and we've shown that the return of investment of uh, using uh, standard measures is 18 to 1 for hypertension. That return of investment is, um, so basically 18 international dollars for every dollar put into hypertension. And that return of investment is seen with only things like maternal and child health interventions and like immunization. So it's extremely high. And we've also shown that in um, low and middle income countries, the biggest bang for your buck is by doing hypertension treatment. And the, 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 the benefits are huge. The benefits are huge uh, when it comes to um, costs. Thank you. Okay. Gentlemen at the back, please. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Augustine Odili. I'm from Nigeria. Um, thank you, the panel, for such a wonderful discussion. Uh, my own comment is on capacity building. Uh, for us, in what we have seen in Nigeria and most other uh, low- and middle-income countries is that uh, the primary health care system was originally designed for maternal and child health. So you discover that introduction of uh, hypertension care in um, the primary health care system was um, a little bit of difficult because the training of those in the primary health care system was originally targeted at maternal and child care. So what we did in International Society of Hypertension, the regional advisory group of, for Africa, was to introduce an online um, school we call Hypertension School for non-physician health workers. Uh, we did a pilot project. Uh, we had about seven countries in Africa, we, you know, listed. We had uh, two months of online training and then uh, two months of what we call in-country mentorship where the, those in primary health care, those non-physicians are attached to, um, you know, uh, in-country mentors, doctors to mentor them. 
And um, I think we tried it in pilot and it showed a huge success. We are just looking for funding to expand it to uh, other African countries. So I think this is something that the uh, WHO would uh, look into. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed. So, Dr. Khan, in capacity building, uh, in, as has been described, is a very important. How, how can you address this? So, actually, I didn't have a chance to, to, to mention it, but in 2021, WHO came out with the guidelines for the pharmacological treatment of hypertension. It's the first hypertension guideline in 20 years by the organization. And funny enough, one of the recommendations is about the use of non-physician healthcare workers. From what I understand from the global community, it's the only guideline to stress that non-physician healthcare workers can be used in the management. Um, and I think we are looking towards building a course as well through the WHO Academy that would talk to um, hypertension management. But in the interim, our regional offices, like uh, the American office and the Eastern Mediterranean, have online courses for hearts as well. And I can't agree more with what the speaker said. Primary health care was traditionally built for maternal and child health and acute conditions. But with things like HIV, we've seen how the system has developed for chronic conditions. And that's really why HEARTS works, because it's built on a similar premise. Mm. And this, the speaker was from uh, Nigeria. I mean, yes. how, how is, I mean, I know we're concentrating on um, Argentina and uh, Chile today, but how many countries in Africa have, have are, are one of those 40? And are, are the challenges different there from? So actually, Nigeria is one of the countries, one of the hearts countries. Yeah. And we're actually super proud because um, just a couple of days ago for World Hypertension Day, they endorsed their protocols to make it national, the drug and dose specific protocol. And they've also outlined a guideline for task shifting for hypertension. Um, and we also have Ethiopia, and we are looking to expand in the region as well, um, because I think I think Africa has a huge burden of hypertension, but sometimes it gets a bit uh, deprioritized when you look at communicable conditions. But now I think there's enough evidence to show that most people in Africa are also dying of heart attacks and strokes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And yes, Dr. Arisada, please do. Just a, fr a brief yeah. comment. I would like to thank our colleague to share this experience in Nigeria because we need to know about those experiences to learn from, from each other, definitely. So, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So, any, if anybody else in the room has got to, uh, is from a heart's country, please let us know and tell us your experience. But let's take the question from the floor. Thank <coughs> you. Mafusha, how is the result of Florida? First, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I uh, would like to make some comments really here, which uh, over the years we learned which have been very informative. First, and as the colleague from Chile told about measurement of blood pressure, the accurate measurement of blood pressure, there's so many tricks which can create a problem, and the American heart have already a chart where at least 10 different points, how you sit, how you get your arm, how you choose the cuff uh, uh, size, etc. because even two millimeter difference in blood pressure can create abnormalities, structure and functional. What I mean with that, we have did studies already, people who think they are even normotensive, sometimes they are really maybe outside, particularly when we put them in a treadmill for three minutes, the blood pressure shoot up very high. So measurement of blood pressure post-exercise or at home should be emphasized. So structural abnormalities, subclinical atherosclerosis, very common in hypertensive, left ventricular hypertrophy, and I wonder if getting them to get an initial, some study or like echocardium, sometimes pictures speak more than tell them words, then they will stick to the medication. So there's so many tricks. We delegate the blood pressure measurement to the person, mm. the lowest, that's wrong, should be the highest person in the office, check the blood pressure. 
and do it right. Okay, thank you. Dr. Zanetti, did you want to make any comment on, on those points in terms of how you mitigate that? Uh, and the, you know? I, I fully agree with your comment. I think this is so critical to have valuable to, uh, and, and one thing I would like to emphasize what you say is the, is the blood pressure control at home because very often you have people that always come with high blood pressure and you increase doses of medication and, uh, and if you take the blood pressure at home, you realize that it's no need to improve, to increase doses, so it's, it's critical. And um, this is one thing that we, we will need to promote more, the, the home mm. measurement. Mm. Okay, thank uh, And instruct the, the people how to do it properly. Thank you. Okay, we've got another question, thank you. Thank you very much. So my name is Christian, I'm from Novo Nordisk. First of all, thank you very much for an interesting uh, discussion. I wanted to ask you about uh, if you see the, the role of the industry uh, in the implementation of this hard package, maybe to overcome some of the challenges that we heard from Argentina and Chile, maybe in a public-private partnership set up of if that has been considered mm. and how you mm. might see that as an opportunity. Sure, thank you. Let me first of all go to Dr. Khan. Is this something that the WHO is interested in or has done in other areas and might take this forward? So for the WHO, I think we have a lot of uh, rules, a lot of legalities about working uh, with industry um, and a lot of, uh, um, yeah, fencer regulations and things. But I do think that at country level, it depends. You know, the idea is that if you're working in the country already and if everyone can have one view on a protocol, for example, I think that's pretty important. And I think if we all saying the same things about what's important in the, you know, in the five steps, then that's super, super important. I think there's also a challenge because hypertension care was so fragmented that I realized that for industry, it's also difficult to do things like drive prices down. We do understand that it's a complex mechanism of demand and supply, not as clear cut as things like insulin. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is get more countries to adopt similar protocols and see if we can drive pool procurement because I think that's when the industry has to step up and that's when they have to reduce prices. Because a lot of people ask, well, the drugs are generic, they're available and they, you know, sufficiently in the market already. But the truth is, if you're pro procuring amlodipine for the population of India, you can say a billion and half of them are adults, and even if you get a one cent US dollar deduction, it's huge on the scale that we're talking about. So I think the demand side needs to meet the supply side. And I think we're trying to work a bit more with countries to understand that as well. Because the sheer numbers and the sheer volume will, will, will simply overwhelm anybody. So I hope that answers some <laughs> of your questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rizzo, or Dr. Tanetti, do you want to add anything? Do you, I mean, collaboration with private industry, is that, you know, is that something you would be open to or would it be helpful? Well, well being very, very straight with the answer, really, is uh, the, the, the cost of the uh, fixed dose medication is the main barrier. We, we know that it improves the, the, the compliance and the blood pressure control makes things easier for the patients. Uh, and also we have evidence now that what we call polypill that's made medication for hypertension plus statins uh, and maybe with, with beta blockers or, or aspirin it also help and there is a, a, a Spanish trial that proves that improve prognosis. But there is very little interest from the industry to to provide this kind of medication because it's mainly generic. 
So yeah. this, this, this is of course where you reach. Thank you, Dr. Narula. So uh, just to add to what all has been said, and specifically the way uh, Taskeen uh, brought it out uh, very well, that uh, you know, like uh, driving down a pill cost by just one cent is going to make a mm. massive difference. So, so we are talking about a pharmaceutical industry on one side, then there are non-pharmaceutical industry on the other side also. So when we talk about the private-public uh, partnership, so essentially one would be looking at the uh, pharma college or pharmaceutical industry and uh, can they help sure driving the cost down uh, doing some of the uh, or helping in the educational mission uh, dissemination of knowledge and uh, so they do it very well and they can uh, contribute to it uh, the other important thing is that uh, how exactly the ai and uh, this uh, novel uh, techniques, uh, wearable devices and all that they can come up with so that the monitoring becomes easier, the analysis become easier. So there is, when we talk about the industry, the, the uh, potential is uh, mammoth. And uh, finally, it is uh, also very important that the novel treatments and uh, novel way of uh, um, uh, managing the blood pressure is uh, 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 brought into consideration. Uh, he talked about, uh, uh, Dr. Lanas just talked about the uh, polypill. For example, there was a very elegant study by Clara Chow from Australia, small number of patients published in Lancet three years ago, where they did the polypills with one fourth, one eighth of the dosage of the recommended uh, 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 interventions and uh, demonstrated that we were able to reduce the side effects and the impact was as big as the full dosage of uh, mm. uh, one or two uh, agents. So essentially when we talk about all these risk factors of cardiovascular disease, they basically are silent risk factors. Mm. They do not cause symptoms and when we start treating them, we start giving them symptoms. Mm. We need to develop the techniques where we are able to reduce the likelihood of side effects and increase the likelihood of uh, outcomes and success. The second major thing could be the mRNA technology which is coming in our way now. And uh, as we have seen it for uh, cholesterol uh, reduction, for example, the Inclisir, and it was discussed yesterday extensively in multiple uh, sessions, that uh, you give one shot uh, twice a year, or even now it's being suggested one shot a year, and you would be able to reduce your LDL cholesterol by 50% for the entire year, mm. right? So something like that where the compliance doesn't become a problem or it becomes much easier, something similar is being done for hypertension also, like Zelbesiran and others. And uh, would we be able to prevent the likelihood of having side effects but having an impact? Now, obviously, the cost of these drugs is very high, mm. but since it is the mRNA technology or RNA uh, technology, the cost in simple chemicals, the cost is going to come down precipitously mm. as uh, we get uh, yeah. more of the uh, agents available here. So when we talk about the industry, absolutely. Academia and industry collaboration is one of the most important things that we can think of. And it reminds me of one of the, and I would end there by saying that, that uh, uh, Dr. Braunwald's talk that I had heard last year when he talked about the academia and the industry relationship. And he said that some of the most important drugs that we have seen, they have come by uh, the collaboration between the industry mm. and academia. Yeah. So I don't think that we can underestimate the role of industry here. We need every stakeholder to jump into the fray. We have to fight this enemy, which is extremely important. Mm. That's great, though. Thank you very much, and you're ahead of me, because I did want to come on to the future of uh, the Hearts Package and how we might use emerging technologies that you've talked about. So that's a fantastic contribution. Thank you. Um, how is but how can hearts remain relevant and so before i come to the final question from the audience you know i want to come to dr khan given what uh, dr narula has said about these you know emerging technologies of mrna and the you know how, could that be incorporated one day into the hearts package at the moment we are talking about simple uh, you know monitoring and uh, simple uh, drug uh, treatments well we never say never <laughs> <laughs> and certainly there's a future to look forward to i think um uh, the it's just that at the moment, the, the kind of numbers and, and the control of hypertension is so dismal um, that we really need to reinforce these ideas in parallel. Uh, 
Um, and I think a lot of places get very, very mixed up and they think that simple is uh, not good. People love to complicate things, particularly in health, I've noticed. Um, but the truth is that if you want to achieve global public health you know, uh, benefits, if you want to reach SDG 3.4, then you really need to think about scale. And in the short term, you've got to think about what works for that scale. Mm. And it's true if there's a breakthrough, for example, we all know about Ozempic, and it's, it's, it's quite a hot topic at the moment mm. as well. Um, but if there's a huge breakthrough like that, why not then incorporate some of it into hearts? Mm. So, so just while we're on the future, so what is the future, what does the future hold? I mean, we've got 40, what's, you know, what's the aim? You said, what's what are the next steps in the short term and the longer term? So for, for, for me, it would be that we have 194 countries that belong to the WHO. To see hearts implemented at scale in all those 194 would be the ultimate goal. Um, but I think in the short term, we're trying to expand, trying to do more regional-wide uh, mm. uh, expansions. So to concentrate a bit on Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean, um, and to strengthen quality measures in the existing regions that have already uh, adopted hearts. Um, but maybe I can, you, you can just indulge me, Jackie. My background is actually from HIV programming. And I used to say that you can't come out of South Africa as a doctor and not be an HIV specialist. But the truth is I wasn't. I was an AIDS specialist. Because what I saw every day was people dying. And I went to hospital every day and I really, really disliked internal medicine was because almost everybody died of an opportunistic infection and died of AIDS. And I see hypertension in that very same feat because almost everybody globally is dying of a heart attack or a stroke. But the truth is that people don't link their uncontrolled hypertension with these cardiovascular and circulatory outcomes. That I feel is a huge gap. And if there's one thing I can ask the audience, it's to think about the health literacy, not only for patients, but for providers as well, that something simple like amlodipine can save a life. And you know, HIV has demonstrated truly how a chronic disease can have a public health response. My dream is to see the other age, hypertension, at that level one day. So that's what I can end with. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if, Dr. if I could add, yeah, to, add to her. I mean, she deserves to be conservative in the position that she is sitting in. And probably I would be in the same stage next year when I would be the president. And uh, today I can be a little more optimistic here. And uh, I probably could uh, simply say that uh, we definitely need uh, the implementation here, as all the uh, panelists are talking about. We definitely need how exactly is this performing. Mm. We need uh, evaluation, repeated analyses, and then tweaking our strategies and uh, coming up with the novel or updating mm. our uh, packages on a periodic basis. Mm. Good point. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Narula. Now let's come to our, uh, the audience member has been very patient waiting there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Bister Zeleva. I work at Children's HeartLink. We uh, advocate and build capacity for pediatric and congenital heart care. But my question has a couple of points. Um, first is medications, and our population uses mo many of the same medications, but medications are expensive, and a lot of people in low and middle income countries cannot afford them. And so uh, Dr. Khan talked about first of all, pool procurement. And I wonder, are there examples where there's been pool procurement among countries, especially in low and middle income countries? India is, you know, its own case because it's so big. So I don't, I, but in Africa, for example. Um, and what about including them in universal health coverage uh, goals? Um, because affordability is a big issue and so, uh, pool procurement potentially could bring uh, prices down, but when you have smaller population, could that be done um, across countries? And I know that's, they're trying to do that with vaccinations, with vaccines, with HIV drugs. And so mm. is that done with cardiovascular medications? Thank, Thank you. you. 
quite a complex question, that one, Dr. Com. so I'm going to throw that one at you straight away. <laughs> no, sure. Um, I think you're quite right. I did allude to pool procurement. So um, with the Pan-American Health Organization, they have something called the Strategic Fund. And that's actually been quite successful in, in pooling and, and using that mechanism. But the thing is, in, in Africa, what we've seen is that countries still need to standardize their treatment protocols. And what we're encouraging now is for them to look at whether they can standardize it across a sub-region. So, for example, Southern Africa, because I'm most familiar with South Africa, the SADC group of countries could very easily standardize a protocol and then use that um, to drive bulk procurement. About your second comment of universal health coverage, I want to stress the WHO's entire mission is universal health coverage. And last year, when we launched the global report on hypertension, we have a quote from Ted Ross saying that hypertension programs are vastly underfunded, neglected, and non-prioritized and that they are a fundamental part of every country's access to universal health coverage and journey towards it. But I want to go a step further because I, I guess I can and say that there's no funding gap in cardiovascular diseases. There's a void. <laughs> And, you know, it actually, <laughs> when I said this to, to, to a group of African countries, um, they actually clapped because they can understand it. And I think that is why it's so important for us to embed something as simple as hypertension treatment into benefit packages. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say you can't, you know, you can't do everything and you can't add every single medication. But if you can add these three drugs that you've selected at the national level, do that and start with that, and then build upon it. Okay, Dr. Khan, thank you so much for that. I think it's a, a fitting uh, time to end our session uh, with a very positive note about what can be done. And I look forward to hearing about more countries that are joining the package with the success that you've, uh, that you've told us about. Thank you to our great panel for giving us the benefit of their experience and about the future potential and how other elements could be inserted into the package when they're properly developed and accepted. So thank you very much indeed for all of your comments. It's been a great session. I think you're all now deserving of your coffee break. I think it's coffee break now, is that right? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think Sean Lucas is going to attend us. So yeah, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you. So, thank you.